Andrea Carter, a very, very successful crime writer. Her murder mysteries are unputdownable. I went to bed at about four o'clock in the morning when, when I was reading the first one. I just couldn't put it down. I had to know the end. And now I have the five of them. And they are based um, on the Inishowen Peninsula. Andrea herself um, is a qualified solicitor and also a barrister, which of course, background wise, is a wonderful background for crime writing. And she has made, she has actually worked in the area where, that she writes about and she visits each location as well as she's writing. Um, She's like, the interview that Moza Jacobs did with Andrea Carter is well worth watching and going back to um, even time and time again, great tips for crime writing. So um, Andrea uh, will do some reading and then we'll have question and answer session after. Thank you very much, Margaret. That's very kind of you. And I'm very flattered that you've read and have all of my books. <laughs> That's great. Um, I am going to read um, from Murder at Grey's Bridge, which is the fourth one. Um, the most recent one is uh, The Body Falls, uh, which is the one that came out last year. Yes. <laughs> and um, uh, there are five in the series and that's the fifth one that came out last year um, and so I'm going to read a little bit from uh, two sections from Murder at Grey's Bridge which is um, an homage really to the um, country house murder mystery which is uh, something that I'd always wanted to do and then I found a way to do it within the initial and mystery series. Um, this uh, is about a, a wedding which takes place over a weekend um, in a rather creepy country house in Inishon. And the piece that I'm going to read um, is when Ben and her friend Maeve the vet arrive on Friday evening. That's the first piece I'm going to read. So it's the very beginning of a weekend, which um, is supposed to be a lovely sunny wedding weekend. But of course, things really don't go according to plan because it's a murder mystery. Um, so I'm going to start. We drove another hundred yards through the trees before emerging at what looked like the back of a very large residence. The drive snaked to the right of the house where a glimpse of blue was visible through the green. It seemed the place had been built to face the shore, creating a strange first impression for a hotel as if it were turning its back on visitors. I drove on past the gable end where a small door was almost completely hidden by a huge pear tree, laurels to our right and azaleas flaming in cerise and orange. When they bought the house, the Greys told me it had been allowed to fall into disrepair, but it seemed the garden had not. Despite the heat, it was mature and lush. As we rounded the building, the shore came dramatically into view the water blue and welcoming in the evening sunshine, an expansive lawn with sprinklers and flower beds of pampas grass and hydrangeas sloped down towards a little beach and pier. Two large boats that looked like fishing trawlers were moored there, the guests' accommodation that Abby had referred to, I assumed. I stopped the car and simultaneously Maeve and I turned to look at the house. It was an Italianate villa in cut limestone, imposing in size, a three-storey central block with a balustrade, an east and west wing and a large portico with steps leading to a red door with a fanlight. But protruding from the right gable was something exceedingly odd. It was a covered footbridge and it appeared to link the main part of the house with another smaller building, almost entirely hidden by dense rhododendron bushes. It was a strange and rather ugly addition that jarred with the rest of the house, omitted on purpose, I assumed, from the brochure I had seen. There was no denying that Grey's Bridge was a fine house, but there was something still and secretive about it, something hidden, even in the bright sunshine a sense that it was hunkering down against the world. What a strange place, Maeve said finally, 
an understatement if ever I heard one. I'm not sure I should say this, she added, her voice low, although we were alone in the car, but I'm not entirely sure I like it. She'd read my mind. She nudged me again. I suppose we'd better park. She pointed to a sign indicating guest parking. Reluctantly, I peeled my eyes away from the house and moved the mini forward, turning into a small area where there were already about six cars. I parked in the one shaded spot that remained under the trees and we climbed out, taking our bags from the boot and making our way around to the front of the house and towards the main door. Where is everyone? Maeve asked, echoing my thoughts as our footsteps crunched across the gravel. I looked at my watch. It was a quarter to seven. I don't know. Having naps before the fun starts? I thought there'd be more people around all right the night before the wedding. A harsh, the harsh call of gulls and the sound of the waves hitting against the pier broke the silence as we walked up the steps and in through the door. The portico had a high ceiling and a stone flagged floor with some threadbare mats and rather strange sculptures. Two pairs of feet, a man's and a child's caught my eye. As Maeve led the way through a church-like inner door, a large barrel-chested man in shorts and a long-sleeved Elvis t-shirt came running towards us, head bowed. He stopped just in time to avoid a collision and looked up in alarm. Ach, Jesus, sorry, wild sorry, not looking where I'm going. He produced a big smile and an outstretched calloused hand. An unlit cigarette was cupped in the other. Kajemer Toshiv, how are you doing? Are you part of the wedding? We nodded, put our bags down and introduced ourselves. The man pumped both of our hands enthusiastically. He was pink skinned and ginger haired, a slight quiff and sideburns giving him a 50s look. That's class. Good to meet you. I'm Fridge, the best man. I'm Kevin's cousin. He grinned. I was rehearsing my speech in my head, wee bit distracted. Maeve managed to keep a straight face. Nice to meet you, Fridge. I'm not sure I did quite so well. I'm sure I'd have remembered if Leah had told me the best man was called Fridge. Should be a rare old weekend anyway, he said, shoving one hand back into the pocket of his shorts now that the formalities had been dealt with. The king is dead. Long live the king, sang his T-shirt. Some class of a house, isn't it? Fantastic, I agreed. He glanced over his shoulder before putting the cigarette-wielding hand to his mouth. You know, it's haunted. Some doll in a long dress stalks the hallways at night. Really, Maeve said with a grin. He nodded. Keep your eyes open and your doors locked. Stories about this place would make your toes curl. But ghosts can get through locked doors, can't they, Maeve said, still grinning. Isn't that the whole idea? Fridge didn't look amused. I wouldn't joke about it if I were you. This is a wild, strange house. His brow furrowed suddenly and then his expression cleared. Anyway, we'll meet up later for the barbecue. We nodded. Hope you're hungry. We've brought a shed load of pollock and mackerel over with us and it needs to be eaten, he added before heading out into the garden. Maeve picked up her bag again. Ever feel like you've just wandered into a Scooby-Doo cartoon? That's the first bit. So that's Friday night just after they arrive. And the next bit um, I'm going to read is um, later that night, um, they have the barbecue. Um, there are some ghost stories told about the house uh, during the course of the barbecue and everybody most people are still up and Ben O'Keefe who is my protagonist who is a solicitor who is the the voice um, that you heard um, in the first section um, she goes to bed early because um, she's not feeling great um, and so this is her going up to bed on her own while the um, barbecue is still happening outside. Other than some clearing up noises from the kitchen, the house was quiet. Standard lamps glowed here and there, and the light was dim and low as I made my way up the stairs. I dawdled, full of curiosity, feeling privileged to have the place to myself, and stopped to have a look at a portrait I hadn't noticed halfway up, drawn in by the stern expression of its subject. It was a woman with a high collar and a cameo brooch, who looked as if she might have been a governess. Beside her were some other framed photographs, old, sepia, a sort of family gallery, I assumed. In one, a man and woman and two children stood stiffly in front of a house I recognised instantly as Grey's Bridge. 
There was no footbridge, I noticed. It must not yet have been added. I was wondering if these were Ian Gray's ancestors, if one of them was Louisa Gray herself, when out of the corner of my eye, I saw a figure at the top of the stairs. I shivered and then instantly told myself off for being silly enough to be spooked by a ghost story. I leaned silently into the wall, trying not to make the floorboards creak underfoot. But the figure, barefoot and in pyjamas, hadn't seen me. He was too busy concentrating on taking something from a side table and hurrying off. Though I couldn't see his face, I was sure it was Leah's sister's boyfriend, Finn. I tiptoed the rest of the way up the stairs. When I reached where he'd been, I saw that one of the little porcelain figures I'd seen earlier was missing. There had been three and now there were only two. I was sure of it. But why would he steal something like that? I wondered. He was gone, so I continued on to my room. On turning the key and pushing open the door, I noticed a strong, heavy scent that hadn't been there before. And when I turned on the light, I saw that a vase of blue hydrangeas has been, had been placed on the dressing table. I wondered who'd put them there. I found it hard to imagine who would have had the time. The scent was a little overpowering and the air was warm, so I opened the window before picking up my wash bag and heading down the hall. The heavy oak door groaned as I opened it. The bathroom was large, with black and white tiles and a bath large enough to fit three people. A precarious looking shower, like a telephone box, looked as if it had been parachuted in in an attempt to modernise. I knew which one I'd be using in the morning. I turned on the tap and waited for the ancient plumbing system to growl into life. Back in my room, I discovered that I'd left in such a rush that I'd forgotten to bring a book. So I took the girl's own annual, girl's own annual I'd found earlier to bed, propping a pillow behind my head and flicking through the pages, careful to handle them as gently as I could, conscious that the book had survived a century already. I noticed some recipes flagged and remembered what Ian Gray had said about Louise's eating, eating disorder. Was she the one who had marked them? Pineapple pudding and oyster soup were expected, but the lentil dal took me by surprise. I thought Indian cooking was more of a modern thing. After a few minutes, I found a short story and settled down to read. It was just what I needed. And when my eyes began to flutter, I put the book on my bedside locker and climbed out of bed to close the shutters before turning off the light. I was drifting off and I heard voices from outside, the islanders going back to their boats, I presumed, but they faded quickly and I turned on my side and fell asleep. An hour later, I woke to the sound of some kind of large vehicle on the drive and a beeping noise like a lorry reversing. A delivery for the wedding, I thought sleepily. It didn't last long and I fell back asleep. A while later, I woke again, this time with a jolt. It felt as if I'd been asleep only minutes, but when I checked my watch, it was 3 a.m. My heart was racing. What had woken me? A noise again? But no, the house was quiet. And outside, there was nothing but the soft sound of the waves. A bad dream? I couldn't remember. With increasing disquiet, I knew what was wrong. There was someone in the room with me. Hands trembling, I flicked on the light and my eyes darted fearfully around from the wardrobe to the window to the hand basin. There was no one here, but there was something. I was sure of it, a presence, a sort of thickening in the air. I shook myself. I could see the entire room and there was no one. What was wrong with me? I had no belief in ghosts. I took a deep breath and a sip from my own, from my glass of water and waited for my heart rate to slow down. After a few minutes, I forced myself to turn off the light, lie down and close my eyes. Suddenly I felt breath on my face and something at my neck like cold hands. I coughed and sat up, waving my arms wildly, hitting nothing but thin air. The floor creaked and I froze. Someone was walking across my bedroom. That's it, <laughs> those are the two readings. So that's the beginning of the weekend. <laughs> that's the Friday night. It's a bit cruel. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you got to leave on a cliffhanger. Definitely. Does anyone have any questions for Andrea? And anyone that can't, um, that hasn't a microphone, can 
type it into the chat if they like. I just sent Miss Carter two questions of mine via direct message. All right, Andrea, did you get two direct messages? Or direct me or? Well, there's a chat section at the bottom, is that it? Yeah, but it would be sent to you only. The sent to me only. Yeah, direct message. Okay. What make what is this it? What what made you want to place a horror fiction element into your story? Example, given an old house with a woman's ghost wandering in it. Is this a crime fiction story? Is that the question? Yes, those are the two questions. The, the first question I, I got seems not to be a question. It just says, sounds like politicians to me. <laughs> oh, the two, the two questions are the, what made you want to place a horror fiction element into your story? And is this a crime fiction story? Yes, though. Part, part of the same question. Mm. OK, um, well, I think you need to read the book <laughs> in order to uh, decide whether it is a crime fiction story. And I would say it is a crime fiction story. Um, and it's not really a horror element. Uh, it's more of a, um, a ghostly element, but it's, it's about atmosphere. Um, so you'll have to read the, the book, I'm afraid, to find out whether it is, in fact, a ghost or not. <laughs> Thank you for answering both questions. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, can I, I'm, I, I'm, yeah, so I, I don't know if I have a question exactly, but I might get to a question, is I'm in, in as you know, um, a couple of us have been introduced to being part of the, uh, of the writing group, so it's of a real, Declan's uh, class. Yeah, yeah, exactly, so it's a real pleasure to be here, but one of the things I was talking about last week was how much I enjoy uh, series, Do you know, getting to know characters, getting to know the place getting to see how things evolve over time and I you know I have a number of sort of favorite characters in in books and I watch out for the next one is coming and it's like that gets saved for the summer holidays and and there's something both re really relaxing I find my body just sort of settling into the story on the one hand but also just that sort of curiosity about what comes next but what I'm interested in I suppose is the way the Inishon Peninsula, I think itself, is a character in the in the story. It's not just this. It's not just the setting, mm -hmm. and, and you know the descriptions of the rain and the floodwaters and the movement and the storms and and how much the weather, you know, appears in the story. So I'm interested. I don't know if there's anything you can say a little bit about that about developing place as a character in the in the story. Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is something that um, that. Uh, writers, I think, disagree um, quite regularly on, um, uh, and, and crime writers disagree on it as well, in terms of whether or not you should set a story somewhere you haven't been, or you don't know, or you don't know well. Um, my feeling is that um, I, I couldn't, I, I, I won't say you shouldn't, because obviously every writer has to find their own way. Um, and I know plenty of writers who write very vividly about places that they haven't been. Um, but for me, um, I, I, having lived in, in Ishoan for, you know, 11 or 12 years, um, I, I know the place very well. And I think my, my stories were always going to be set there, that the, 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 Every, everything's there that I need, you know, the, the deserted beaches, the, uh, the uh, cliff, the cliffs, the wind, the, the, the extreme weather, the, um, the deserted forts, the, you know, there is just something about the landscape in, in Ishoan that just is so rich. Um, for me, it seemed a perfect place to to set um, a mystery. Of course, I was living there as well while when I started writing, so it was natural that I would set the stories there. Mm. Having said that, now I live in Dublin, and it is very important for me if I'm writing an Inishowen mystery that I spend time there. So mm. I haven't written one. The, the last Inishowen mystery came out last April and I haven't written one since for obvious reasons <laughs> it's quite difficult for me to get there at the moment and has been um, uh, e with each book that I've written while I've been living in Dublin 
I've uh, spent time there. I've, you know, rented a, a cottage or um, a, a combination of staying with friends and renting somewhere. And I, I drive about to all of the locations that I'm using in my books because a lot of the locations I use are real. Some of them aren't. Some of them are fictional. Um, and some of them are inspired by, by real places, but I've fictionalized them. Um, but a lot of them are real. Um, and um, even though they're places that I... I know very well from having lived there for over a decade, I need to remind myself of them and I need to work out exactly where I'm going to put the body. <laughs> I mean, for, for the body falls, um, I, I um, drove that route um, a number of times, the, the route that Malloy, I don't know if you've, you've read it, but there is, there is a journey in the middle of the night, Malloy, and uh, Ben drive to where the body has fallen down onto the vet's jeep in the rain and the floods. And I drove that at night in the dark. Um, and I did an event for um, uh, Donegal Libraries um, um, a couple of months ago. And they asked, I was asked, <laughs> had I driven that? Um, and they, they knew I had <laughs> because uh, the, the woman who asked me the question ha knew all of the turns and knew each of the bridges. And I got the sense that when she was reading it, she was counting the bridges to see if I got them correct, you know. Um, so I, I'm glad I, it, to me, that's important. You know, it's important when I'm writing about a real place that I, that I, you know, paint the place accurately and that I kind of try and convey the atmosphere properly um, and the mood. So it, it wasn't just enough for me to visit the places. I needed to visit them in the right weather <laughs> as well. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, Michael is asking you, um, is the location based on a real house? Yes, sorry, I did see that. Yes, um, it, it isn't, no. Um, the, the, it's, it's an accum Grace Bridge is an accumulation of factors. Um, there are elements of my parents' house in it. My parents live in a, a Victorian schoolhouse that they restored. Um, and there are elements of, um, there are elements of Anna McCarrig, the Tyrone Guthrie Centre. The, the sculptures of the two, the feet, the, the men, uh, the man and the boy's feet, that's there. That's there in the, in the um, porch in Anna McCarrig. Um, and the one of the portraits uh, is inspired by a portrait that's on the wall in Anna McCarrick because uh, I, I finished the book there when I was madly editing it just before it was going to be sent into um, the uh, my editor. Uh, I was there, so I added some elements. But there's also a very I, I came across um, a house. Uh, I think it's somewhere in Limerick, um, which is a, um, a, a ruin, which also fed into my um, thoughts about it. So it's an accumulation of real and fictional places, really, you know, all merged together. But the actual road that I have described um, in the in the book where uh, Grace Bridge is located, um, there are uh, there are no houses on that particular road. And I had to um, apologize for that in uh, in the acknowledgements to the people of uh, in the show because they would recognize that road and say there's no big house on that road. <laughs> Can I ask, in, in uh, because you have a number of characters that return in every or every book, but um, is there ever a confusion with the real people of Inishowen? Like they Ooh. they think you've uh, portrayed one of them, or uh, is 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 that diff that mu is that difficult to avoid? Well, well I'm quite I'm, I'm I'm quite upfront about um, the fact that uh, two of the characters are um, inspired by people that I know, friends of mine. Um, and one is Leah, who uh, is inspired by Lily, who worked with me for a very long time. Um, and one is Maeve the Vet, who is inspired by my friend Fidelma the Vet. And uh, Fidelma um, is, is incredibly helpful to me when it comes to writing any uh, veterinary scenes. Um, I will send her um, my the, my veterinary scenes basically for her to, to check or, or talk to her about them if I don't send them to her. Um, when the cat was poisoned, Guinness the cat is poisoned in one of the books and um, I she gave me advice and told me what she would do in those circumstances and she would put the cat on a drip uh, which contained vodka which uh, 
that I would never have known that had I not um, asked her about it. So, so the research can sometimes turn up um, interesting um, flavors uh, for for the, for the books. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 straight that that I've I've, ba- I've those two characters are based on people that I know, and they don't mind. They seem to be okay about it. <laughs> but but none of the criminals are. As far no, as oh no, <laughs> oh no. Look, I I used to be a lawyer. I'm careful about that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Andrea, just to follow on to that. Uh, uh, okay, some of your when you're thinking of a character, do you think of a person you've met? Or no, and would you, would you base their personality? I know it's uh, you know they mightn't be someone that you 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 know very well, but that you've met along the way. Would you base them on a real person? Well, I think I think when you're creating characters, human observation is very important. I mean, you've got to your your characters have there has to be an element of truth about your characters. You 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 don't pluck a character completely from your imagination. Um, you've got to take elements of what you've observed in other people and in yourself. Um, in terms of um, habits and tics and personality traits and and responses. Um, And so I think all of my characters are an accumulation, uh, a bit like the house. They're they're an accumulation of elements of people I know and people I've just met or people that I've watched in the supermarket or, you know, so you you have to be inspired by real life and your characters have to be inspired by real life or they won't be real. Um, but you don't, you don't pluck somebody that you know and put them in your book um, because that's um, not the safest thing in the world to do um, if they're recognisable as, as that, that person that you know. Um, but certainly you take, you, you're going to take um, traits and, and, both physical and um, both physical and psychological elements of, of people that you know and people that you've met. That's part of writing, you know, observation and um, making your characters believable. You, you have to, your reader has to think, oh, uh, you know, that reminds me of somebody or, you know, that sounds like somebody I could meet or somebody that I know. Um, because if your characters aren't, believable then then you have a problem you're writing fiction but but it, there needs to be an element of truth about it mm. does that answer the question yeah thank you may i ask something else you um, may, yes. <laughs> uh, that i really enjoy you know the environment that you offer us as readers it's like a little holiday to go there but um, do you work, I mean, it, uh, you seem to be very economical with words, like one, you, you just use one sentence and it paints a scene like you did with the house, you know, the, the sea was whispering softly, or I can't remember the exact words, but that was just one sentence and it put you right there. Uh, is that something you work on really hard? Do you sort of pair it back, 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 or is it natural, something that comes naturally? It, it, oddly, the, 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 painting of the setting for me comes relatively easily um, when it comes to Inish Owen because I tend to leave those sections until I'm there and so I'm simply writing what I'm looking at or what I'm walking through or I mean for instance the um, the well of ice which is the one I think you were reading when we were yeah. chatting yes um, I reading it then but I've read but, more since <laughs> oh good <laughs> the um uh I'm hoping that's a good sign um yes, yes. <laughs> Margaret absolutely <laughs> the the well of ice um that there is a uh Schliebschnacht plays quite a big yeah. uh, part in it and I walked Schliebschnacht um just before I wrote that scene. I had written the sort of skeletal elements of the scene and what happened in the scene, what I wanted to happen in the scene, which is the discovery of the body. Um, But I didn't have the the detail in terms of the landscape. And so I walked it uh, with uh, Lily actually, who inspires Leah. Um, We walked it one morning uh, in, 
I think it was quite late November. So it wasn't far from the time of year that it happens, that, that particular walk uh, with Ben and Malloy. And I had a notebook with me and I just took notes and I took photographs. And I so then that evening or the following morning, I wrote that scene. So it, it came quite easily to me as a result. I, I suppose the the setting in the Inishowen books is is authentic because I'm often physically there when I'm writing those scenes and that makes it easy for me to write those scenes so they 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 come easily if I was trying to write a scene set somewhere that I hadn't been for a very long time or that I'd never visited I might struggle I mightn't find it as easy you know um but we'll we'll see (laughs) that's obviously going to happen at some point but um for me, this for me, setting is very important. The location is very important. So I, I, I want it to be authentic, and I want people to be transported um, because it's what I enjoyed very much when I was a child reading. Mm. That sense of just losing yourself in a book as a child, and no longer being in your bedroom or no longer being you know, on the couch or no longer being wherever it was that you were reading the book, but being absolutely in that place where the book was set. Mm -hmm. Um, And that feeling of being wrenched out of it, if you were called to go and clean your room or called for dinner or, you know, so that is something that that's an element of of reading fiction that is very Mm. valuable to me and I treasure. And if somebody tells me that that's that they're getting that out of my books, then that's the ultimate compliment for me. That's what I want to happen. So that makes no, any sense. Yeah, it, cert- it certainly is what I got out of it. I usually read nonfiction these days. And this, this is the first time in a long time that I really had that feeling like, oh, yes, I'm going to go there again. Yes. Great. Oh, good. <laughs> good. And as, as I was saying about, you know, doing the, the event in, in Donegal, um, it, it was very important to me that the people that know the place so well um, felt that I had portrayed it um, accurately and, uh, you know, and conveyed the beauty of the place and the atmosphere, you know. I think you certainly succeeded in that, Andrea. There, there is the, the atmospheric detail that you create and the your use of words, your descriptive language. It's... It's just a joy to read as well oh, as being you. transported there. You know, you feel, you know, I, I kind of feel I know the square where the auctioneer <laughs> is and where the, the architect and all that. And the place, know. It, you know, because I'm from Clonakilty in West Cork and there's a similar square. And I yes. Can, yeah. I can picture it. Oh, that's good. That's good. Well, that's, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that because that's, that's what I'm seeking that's what I'm trying to do, you know, um, and it's what I enjoy when I'm reading as well. You know, I, I you you write, you try and write a book that you would want to read yourself. That's what you find yourself doing. Um, and if you want to gain pleasure out of writing, which is incredibly important. I mean, you're not you're not writing for anybody else when you're writing your novel because you have to spend a long time with it so you're going to have to gain some pleasure out of it yourself the first reader that you've got to satisfy is yourself um and so i i write books that i would want to read um so i i like i i I try and achieve in my books what i seek in other people's books um, and, and the type of books that I enjoy reading. One of the things as well that Declan Burke mentioned to us was he said that he gets, he loves doing his drafts. Like he, he just, when the book is finished, the first draft, say, and the, he said, he thinks that's the hard work done, that yes. he just loves all the drafts to come. Yeah. And when you say you took your notebook to the location, is that after you've done the first draft? Yes, it is very much so. Yeah, my um, I, I think I spoke about um, my um, writing process a little bit um, on the interview. Um, but uh, what, what I do is I write, uh, so I don't want to really repeat myself, but um, what I 
tend to do is what I've done with each book so far is that I write a first draft uh, quite quickly um, and I write it blind. I don't plot it in advance. I just start with a location and something else, some other kind of um, idea or character or something, but, but not, not a lot. I don't have a lot of raw ingredients um, when I start off. And I write my first draft straight through without editing myself. And it uh, usually ends up being about half the length of the final novel. So our, my novels are in or around the 92,000 word mark, which is kind of average for a crime novel. Um, and my first draft is usually about 40, 45,000 words. And it's absolute rubbish. It's really, really terrible. The, um, <laughs> the language is really lazy. Um, the, uh, you won't find any beautiful descriptions in there in the first draft. The characters are really flat. You know, they're pretty much stick characters. Um, and sometimes their names change halfway through. I forget what I've called somebody and the name changes halfway through. The grammar is terrible. The punctuation is awful. It's really a mess. Um, and it, it doesn't get to the full. It doesn't complete the plot. Probably the last um quarter to a third is not written so it doesn't the narrative isn't finished um but it's got a thread of a story you know there's a skeleton there um even if it doesn't have a head <laughs> it's there's a skeleton there and so I leave it alone for about two weeks and then I come back to it and I write my second draft on top of that um first draft and so my second draft is probably about 60,000 words and it gets a little bit further to the end and some of the descriptive stuff is going in. Not a lot, probably, even at that stage, but the characters are beginning to come to life. And I'm beginning to make connections between the characters. And I'm beginning to get to know a little bit more about, about my story. Um, and then the third draft is probably where the, the detail starts to be filled in, uh, which is probably the, the stage at which I've probably been to in its own you know, before that, while, I, while I'm writing the first and second draft. But by the time I get to the third draft, I need to spend um, a, a concerted period of time there. I need to spend a week or two weeks just there on my own writing and visiting and driving around the place and taking photographs. And so the detail in terms of the landscape goes in probably at that stage, at the third draft stage. And then there are two more drafts, usually. I usually do about five drafts before it gets sent to my um, editor in London. Um, and, and then at that stage, she will either um, tell me that I need to do serious edits on it, that there are serious structural edits, or it goes straight to copy edit, which is what happened with, no, not with that one, with this one. This one is the only book of mine that went straight to copy edit. She said it didn't need any edits. So I was really, really lucky with that one. Um, so yeah, it's it's very much a layering process for me. That's the way I write. Um, and I think Declan's not dissimilar with that. He, 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 he writes, he layers with each draft, it gets fuller. Maura has put in a comment there. She has a bad connection where she is, but she lives at the base of, in, of the Inishon in Burnfoot. And she All said, right. you capture it so beautifully, she says. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You see, it's, it's she that I want to please <laughs> in terms of the landscape. Hello. You know, it's important to me that the people that know it mm. um, think I've portrayed it well. Mm. Can I ask another question? Would that be fair? I'm conscious I've, course, I've conscious already spoken. Of course. Yeah. I, Absolutely. One of the things I realise, I mean, just as I'm sort of remembering back the books, that one of the reasons I enjoy them uh, so much is because of your strong sort of women characters. So the female characters, I mean, not just the main character, but it's like they're they're not stereotypical, you know, in Good. that way at all. And that they live sort of interesting and real lives, you know, with and around each other and with and around the men and the children in their lives. But they're not, you know, they're not peripheral to that, that they have. And I, I'm just curious about that. Was that a very deliberate decision on your part to write women in that sort of way? Or is that what, what emerged? 
No, no, I think it's just what emerged. It's a bit like, you know, uh, the, the question that Colin was asking me. Uh, you know, I write about the type of women that I know, um, and that's my experience of women. Uh, so that's the way I'm going to write them. And I always reckon that I'm, I'm an equal opportunities employer as well. You know, you're just as likely to be a murderer as a murderee if you're a woman mm. in my books. So, um, mm. yeah, you could get killed by a woman just as easily as by a man yeah. in my books. Yes, but there's something nice that there's something sort of I like that because I suppose I realized that I'm just going to have gotten very tired of those tropes where it's young women and girls yes. who are who are murdered in very sort of grisly and graphic sort of ways. And then that becomes the, you know, there's something yes. about about that then that just gets played out over the book. And I think it's it's sort of it's wearisome at this point, you know, but it's. Yeah, also yeah. Although I think it's improving. You know, I think yeah. that certainly was the case. Um, you know, a number of years ago, but I think it is improving. I think you're less likely to find the, you know, naked young woman on the train tracks and find that mm -hmm. there's some awful sexual crime has been committed. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not, it's not, yeah, it, it's, it's becoming accepted that that is a trope, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that we don't need it really. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that, you know, violence against women shouldn't be portrayed because, again, it's the truth. It mm. happens. And of course, it should be portrayed and not ignored. Mm. But it doesn't have to be the recipe for every single crime novel. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Yeah. Thanks. Yes, yeah, both. <laughs> so, um, you wrote a really beautiful sentence in uh, White, in your first book. Uh, I, even as a teenager, I wondered what it was that made people kill. And I, I'm just wondering, writing about the topic of, you know, people killing each other, did you get any closer to finding an answer to, to that question? Uh, I sort of, uh, yes and no. I mean, I think, I think it's something I wondered um, as a lawyer as well. Um, I think it's something I, I think about, you know, I, I, practiced law and then I and now I've ended up as a crime writer so it's obviously something I think about um I sometimes think that we're all capable of it mm -hmm. uh, given the right circumstances um and I think that um I think it's something that you've got to access um as a crime writer I think you've got to access your own worst instincts You've got to, we all have a darker side to our character. Um, most of us control it. And for some of us, it's, for some of us, it's, it's more, um, it's, it's more present than others. Uh, but we all, we all know that there are things that make us very, very angry. Um, and it might be injustice um, or it might be, you wanting to get revenge on somebody who has hurt you or um, I think we can all access that feeling of wanting to kill somebody like genuinely wanting to kill somebody it usually passes but I think we've all felt it at some stage so I think as crime writers we, we have to access that within ourselves and and try and portray it in some way um, in in what we're in the fiction that we're writing, I think that can be very useful. Um, being very honest about your own less um, pleasant um, instincts, if that makes any sense. Thank you. Okay. There's another question there, Andrea, from Catherine. Sure. I'll have, well, I'll have a look first. Um, how important is it to find the right agent? Um, I would say, yes, it's very important to find the right agent. Um, I think, uh, you know, an agent writer relationship is uh, one that should um, last uh, for a long time. Um, I have um, an agreement with my agent. I remember signing this agreement with my agent and noticing this paragraph um, in the two page um, agreement that I signed with her when she signed me up. Um, and the paragraph said that we could each leave 
the other one, we could break the agreement with a month's notice. So she can tell me she doesn't want to represent me anymore with a month's notice. And I can tell her that I don't want her to represent me um, with a month's notice. And I commented on it, um, you know, wh wh when she was signing me up <laughs> um, and I was signing it, I said, that's an interesting um, clause there. I, I don't have any difficulty with it, but it's an interesting one. And she said, Yes, well, the, the agent writer relationship is a bit like a, a marriage. You don't want to stay in it if it's not working. Um, and, and so that has kind of always stayed with me. Um, and it's true, you know, it's I, I've, I've had the same agent um, now since I signed with her, I think in 2013. My first book came out in 2015. And I signed my contract with Little Brown in um, 2014. So I, I signed with her in the summer of 2013. Um, and she's great. She's, you know, she's she's been absolutely first class and she she talks me down if, if something's bothering me. Um, but she will also, um, she'll also, she's a very good straight talker. Um, I had uh, I drafted a book. I, I wrote a standalone book, um, which was really at an early stage. It was probably at the second draft stage, so it wouldn't have been anywhere near being submitted for, to publishers. Uh, but uh, I wrote it um, about a year ago, and I sent it to her, and she told me it was terrible. <laughs> I mean, she didn't put it quite like that, but when I asked her whether I should continue to work on it or not, she said, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> and it broke my heart. It really broke my heart because I had been working on it for quite some time and it was a, a departure from the Inish Owen books. And um, for me, it was, it was a challenge writing, uh, uh, you know, something that was different from the Inish Owen books. And I really wanted her to like it, um, but she didn't think it was any good. Um, and she needed to tell me that. And now when I look at it, of course, a year later, she's right. It was terrible. I mean, <laughs> uh, but she was she she tells me that. So so that's a good agent. Uh, you know, a good agent is somebody who fights your corner with your publisher has good connections with editors and will send your book to editors who will then read it because she has sent it to them and said it's really good and will also tell you what you don't want to hear um you know and it was better that she told me that it was no good than to tell me it was good when she didn't think it was and then send it off to loads of editors in london who would then see this terrible book that i had written you know so <laughs> A good agent is is yeah is is very uh, is very important, um, and I think I think you'll know when when you meet uh, your agent if if there is an agent who wants to sign you up. I think it's very important that you meet and have a coffee or you know have lunch or whatever that you're actually in the same room. I mean I know that's quite difficult at the moment, but or some kind of Zoom thing maybe I suppose if it's a London per person, it's very important that you meet and that you you actually like each other. Um, it's a bit like, you know, having an employee that you're going to have to work in the same room with. Um, you need to like each other. Not only need should they be capable of doing the job, but they need to be somebody that you can actually get on with and, and communicate with and understand each other, you know. Um, having said that, that, you know, uh, Kerry, who is my agent, um, I went off and wrote the first chapter of another book. She told me this book was terrible. I cried for about three days. And then on the Monday, I started writing another book. And I wrote the first chapter really quickly, which is surprising. I didn't mourn that book for very long, which should have told me something. Wrote the first chapter of, of the book that I'm working on at the moment and sent it to her. And she came back to me and she said, I love it. I love it. Keep going with that one. And so I've just sent her about, about four weeks ago, I sent her, um, or she came back to me four weeks ago, but about six weeks ago, I sent her, the, the full draft, the full 96,000 words of this new book. And I was terrified that she would come back to me and tell me to stick it in the bin again. And I had a horrible feeling that she was dreading having to tell me that this book was no good either. But she came back to me and told me that she loved it and that it's a runner and that I, so I'm now 
writing writing another draft of it, but uh, with her edits. So and it's she's not an editor as well. So right, and it's not part of the initial ones, is it? It's not. No, it's um, I I. I, I won't write another Inish Owen book until I can actually physically be there for a decent yeah. period of time. Um, and I need to finish this one first. This one's set in Dublin. It's more gritty and it's more noir, really, than murder mystery. And I'm looking forward to it already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, at least it's not terrible. <laughs> well, when your agent, um, like she seems to have an in, in like, Obviously, you're published in all the English speaking world. But when she did the German ones, did she have to get an interpreter for, for well, the ones in Germany? I'm, I'm very lucky that um, my agency um, uh, have their main office is in Paris, actually. Um, and their second office is in uh, London. And they also have an office in New York. Now, that makes them sound huge, uh, but they're not. They're, they're kind of they're a boutique agency. So I have um, Susanna Lee herself uh, is who owns the agency. She's based in um, Paris. So if there's anything in terms of translations or, or European rights, she's the one who deals with them from Paris. And um, I have uh, separate um, American publishers and it was the New York office, the my New York agent in that office who, um, negotiated that um, mm -hmm. and found me the American publishers. So so I, I, that's another plus um, that my agency has international reach, even though they're not huge, they're not huge publishers, but they are not huge, huge agents. They're not one of the massive offices. Um, so I, they're excellent, really excellent, really. I'm just lucky. I just got a lucky break really that I ended up with them. Talent, Andrea. No, <laughs> it's also about there's also a big chunk of luck. You know, there is um, there's an element of having the right person read the right submission at the right time. You know, and I think that will always be relevant that if they're looking, a particular agency is looking for something in particular, that they're maybe looking for a, a crime fiction writer or they're looking for um something gritty or they're looking for rural noir or they're looking for a psychological crime novel or and 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 a good one lands on their desk you know at the right time and sometimes i think maybe editors say to them if you if you come across x send it to me you know so are there any more questions will i have a look at the Oh yeah, Cullum has one in there. Oh yes, I, you used Irish in your reading. You, um, I, I don't use a lot of Irish. Um, I used Irish in that uh, particular section because um, there was, uh, there's an island in that particular book and uh, I decided to make it uh, Irish speaking. Um, or uh, predominantly Irish speaking. Um, so I wanted to, I didn't want to write all the scenes on the island um, in Irish and I didn't. Uh, so I just sprinkled a little bit of Irish throughout in order to um, give, give that sense. Um, and I, I, I've had some issues. Um, what I have issues with international readers about or um American readers particularly, is my use of Jesus and God and um, that kind of thing. And uh, I've had quite a few um, very negative reviews uh, on Amazon uh, from American readers who really don't like my uh, taking the Lord's name in vain at all. Uh, but I'm not going to change. I mean, that's the way Irish people speak. And part of, you know... <laughs> Part of the, uh, um, you know, when my, uh, and in fairness to my American publishers, they don't ask me to. Um, they, every so often a word will come up that they don't understand. 
um, or I'll have used a term that might be used in Donegal that they don't understand. And sometimes they'll say, well, you know, that it, readers aren't going to know what that means. So we're going to have to edit that. Um, or sometimes they'll go, fine. Yeah, that's grand. People will guess, you know, and we and they want the flavor of um, uh, in a show one and they want the Irish flavor. And uh, so there's no point in them um, editing all of that out there's no point in them editing everything that they liked about the books out <laughs> for um for an american audience but yeah i get a right hammering for the the jesus and the god and the <laughs> we, we get that as well in the poetry circuit um, oh i bet <laughs> because of zooming because we have a lot of americans in our audience and we go to a lot of american um you know um poetry groups Right. They, they find it very disconcerting. They're all, they always like. They're, yeah, they're, they're uncomfortable with it. Yeah. They don't, yeah. yeah. And I mean, so some of the kind of um, nicer uh, reviews, nicer negative reviews I've had on um, Amazon about that have said, you know, the books are great. I just don't understand why she has to uh, <laughs> you know, take the Lord's name in vain. Why does she have to keep saying Jesus? You know, there's lots to like about the books. It's almost as if they're really sad that, you know, I would do that to these lovely books, you know. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm not going to stop because, you know, I'm, I'm I, the, the voices need to be Irish. Um, and it's the way people speak. It's the way, certainly the way, in a show when people speak it's the way i speak it's the you know so yeah it's the same here in cork we speak like that as well mm. Mm. it needs to be authentic you know it needs to be there, there, there maybe don't understand it's like a kind of familiarity you know it's not it yeah. it's not even meant as as swearing or anything like no that. Just, exactly yeah it's in people's lives and they use it yeah yes yeah yeah definitely yes. yeah but um, so, so I haven't been, I haven't been told it. So the short answer to that question, which uh, was asked, um, is that no, I, nobody said anything to me about the use of Irish, but it's the, it's the, um, the Irish idiom, I suppose, the, mm -hmm. that I get criticised for, particularly the, the Jesuses. Well, I see, is there another question? Has anybody else got anything else? Thank you. I'd say that's about it for questions. Unless anyone who hasn't asked a question would like to say something or a comment, a contribution of any kind. Oh, well, somebody has, uh, there is a comment actually um, from Dee saying those oh, negative yeah. reviews from American readers on Amazon must have been from hardcore Southern US evangelical Christian types. I know these types well. I used to live in Georgia in the so-called Bible Belt. Oh, well, fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, Dee is right. Thank you. That makes me feel better. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Any other questions? I think that's that. That sets that's you. That's it. <laughs> okay. Really enjoyed it, like everyone oh. else, I think. It was great, Andrea. And we'd oh, well, look, <laughs> thank you for asking. <laughs> We'll get to hear about how successful this was. Oh, but, good, uh, good. And uh, are, is he teaching on Zoom at the moment? I presume it's on Zoom. Is. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's on Zoom. Yeah, because we're all over the place. It was great from that point of view. True. You didn't have to travel to Dublin for it, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's great. From Cork to Donegal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's two from abroad to international people as well on the course. Right. Mm. That's great. Okay. Yeah. I'm, it's funny. I'm doing this event, obviously this week, which is sort of clonic guilty. And uh, mm. I'm doing an event on Sunday night. Um, not this Sunday night, actually. I thought it was this Sunday night. Next Sunday night in San Diego. And I don't have to. Oh I'm in the same room. <laughs> so. <laughs> like it, That's like the poetry because you can be here once a month. And every Saturday night at midnight, I go to Nashville on Zoom. Ah, brilliant. <laughs> Actually, that's my problem, too, uh, that they, uh, the, it's a, an event on Sunday night and it's on Sunday uh, afternoon at about three o'clock um, in California. 
But of right. course, that means it's it's eleven o'clock on Sunday night yes. for me. It starts, and <laughs> they've all they've already put it back. They 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 said they originally scheduled it for four p.m. on Sunday night, and I said, "You do realize that's midnight for me. I'm not going to be awake." So they've managed to put it back to to eleven o'clock. So that'll have to do me. <laughs> exactly. I love the midnight ones. <laughs> really? I think oh, look, you, you've been there first. I, have, I haven't had one yet. So mm -hmm. I look forward to it. So now we have crime writers here and we have an open mic. But we also have Brendan McCormack. Um, so, um, Moza, do you want to introduce the next? If Brendan wants to do his. I'll go if that's okay. I've just been summoned next door, but thanks a million. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. Andy. Thanks for having me. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Andy. I don't know if you can... Well, that was great, I think. Um, I'm going to introduce Brendan. <laughs> Brendan is actually somebody who used to come a lot to um, the actual Dubara spoken word when we, before COVID, when we were still in Clonakilty, the back of the pub, the Barras. And he gave a workshop there and he did a lot of readings. He's a, a writer and poet himself, but he's also organized uh, Bloom's Day, because today is Bloom's Day. It's the, uh, if you know James Joyce, Ulysses, it's the one day he describes in a very multi-page book. Brendan can tell you exactly how many pages. And so Hello. Brendan has today, <laughs> Brendan is a real expert. Let me, let me, let me check. <laughs> so he's done something today to celebrate a virtual Bloom's Day in a, a special way. Take it away. Please. Brilliant, thanks Moza. And, and thanks for the opportunity to share with you tonight. Uh, I, I would say that environmentalism has gotten in the way of my writing over the last few years and has taken me off in different different tangents. Uh, but Bloomsday in Clonakilty, we've had quite a nice tradition over the last few years where the Cope Foundation, uh, the attendees there who are in care and go into the day units and so forth, uh, have often dressed up in Bloomsday traditional garb and come down to the Barras and Michael O'Neill's uh, butchers across the road from the bars would provide us with fresh kidneys so we'd have a, a real blast of Bloomsday and as somebody who grew up and went to school in Glass Tool near uh, Joyce's Tower, uh, Ulysses has been very much part of my own kind of narrative as a, as a young reader trying to struggle through it at the end of Dunleary Pier the first time I wrote it or the first time I uh, read it. So on Friday, and I didn't think there'd be any blooms this year, the Coke Foundation, Katya, who looks after them there, rang me up and said they were all excited and they wanted to do something. They had their costumes and they'd been doing Joyce art and had prepared readings. So myself and James Joyce's great grand nephew, Philip Joyce, who lives in Clonakilty, went down there this morning at around half 11. Uh, and we had a few of the Cope Foundation attendees doing readings and one in sign language, uh, which is quite phenomenal for a book that is always considered unreadable, that people with these kind of challenges have been my best readers <laughs> over the years and should really put all other Irish to shame. Uh, it's interesting just coming in on the back of the crime novel and listening about, you know, language and so forth. And you think back to Joyce. Nice one, Margaret. You think back to Joyce being banned uh, for a book full of words, for words that do nothing until you actually read them. Uh, and they, they then make a place in your mind and make a place of people in your mind. And, and when you get past all of the usual nonsense about Joyce's uh, Ulysses, it's really a pretty ordinary tale of ordinary Dublin and the <laughs> extraordinary things that go on in, I would imagine if I, if I got into Margaret's head or Michael's head or Colm's head or Moses' head, there would be extraordinary things going on all the time. Extraordinary bits of courage, extraordinary things and challenges that come to each of us. Uh, and I suppose that's, that's really 
in terms of Joyce of taking this age old narrative tradition, one of the oldest, and I always think he used Homer because there is no reliable narrated, narrated history uh, in Irish mythology because all of our mythologies have been rewritten so many times uh, over the centuries that Homer was a reliable narrator for Joyce's unreliable narrators to wander around Dublin. So it's, it's quite a juxtaposition. And with it being about 100 years old, there is something very familiar in these times to the 1920s. There is some kind of crisis in the world, a crisis of consciousness, a crisis of the future. Uh, and so Joyce's Ulysses, I think, still speaks very strongly. So I don't know, Moza, we, we have a YouTube video. I can put the link in, or if you want me to show uh, a small bit of it, I won't do, it's, it's only about 10 minutes, but I won't do the full amount. Uh, and if anybody's inclined to share it on their social media, because it would give a great kick to the people in the Cope Foundation, because I've been told they'll be buzzing now after today for the next two weeks, because the last 12 months have been phenomenally difficult for people who do have needs and do have care needs uh, to have received their normal kind of care. So for me today now is a privilege and an honor to go down there and, and share this space with them uh, about a book uh, that I deeply love and uh, a book about a city that I deeply love. Uh, though like Joyce, I prefer not to live there anymore. <laughs> I have recycled myself down to West Cork. Uh, so, Mose, what should I do now? <laughs> yeah. to put up the link to the video and I could read a small bit from, from Ulysses and then I'll sit back and enjoy the rest of the evening because it's quite a while since uh, I've been in this space. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I can put in the link in the chat and we'll, we'll share it in, on our Facebook page and um, you can read your own... Perfect. I mean, I don't know. I don't, there was a question just now. What is Bloomsday? Uh, because it's, it's very familiar here, but obviously not. Bloomsday is June the 16th, uh, 1904. And the action of Ulysses takes place in those 24 hours from when Bloom gets up in the morning and makes his breakfast and feeds his wife in bed and goes off and buys a few bits and bobs. The journey follows him through the day with, as he's the protagonist, Ulysses, as in Homer's epic voyage. That epic voyage, I think, was, what, 10 or 20 years that Ulysses was lost. And Leopold Bloom is wandering around Dublin till the small hours in the morning and meeting his, his kind of surrogate son, Stephen Dedalus, who plays the part of Tele Tele Telemachus, while Molly Bloom is the homebound Penelope waiting for her man to return. And in her great soliloquy at the end, she goes through all the men she, have lo she has loved uh, and comes to the conclusion that she loves her husband the most. Though whether that would extend into the day after this novel is, is a question. Uh, and I think we all know that kind of transitory permanent love that each of us experiences in different ways. So that's where Bloomsday comes from. And it was originally begun by the likes of Paddy Kavner, uh, Brian Nolan, known as Smiles Nicopoline or Flan O'Brien, uh, and Anthony Cronin, who was three young lads on the piss, got completely wasted on one of the first Bloomsdays. And there's quite an entertaining video of them being on the piss and Brian Nolan having a piss against the wall, I think, then in, in Glass Tool. Uh, and that's where the tradition came from. Uh, and it's a great tradition, it's a great celebration of, of the Irish taking the English language and, and recreating it. Uh, and it's a bit sad at the moment because Joyce's greatest short story, The Dead, the house that it was set in, is currently being turned into a hostel, which probably says a lot about Ireland's attitude towards literature and the arts and culture, though there are signs of positive change coming at the moment. So that's, that's really what Bloomsday is about. Uh, and I'm used to rattling on about it because we've done it on and off, I think, for about five or six years now in Clannacilty. 
uh, and we're, we're quite lucky to have Joyce's grand nephew, Philip Joyce, come and share some family secrets and all the rest of it with us. So if I read just a short piece, I'm going to read from chapter three, which is Proteus. And one of the interesting things about Joyce is his use of time for a novel that is over the course of a day. He introduces time in a really deeply kind of philosophical sense in that it is always happening. Sometimes in classical novels, time isn't the thing, it's people that are happening. But in Joyce's Ulysses, time is happening. And around the same time, Einstein was telling us that time was happening in ways that we didn't fully understand uh, and probably haven't quite grasped until today. So this is Proteus. Ineluctable modality of the visible, at least that if no more, taught through my eyes. Signatures of all things I am here to read, sea spawn and sea rack, the nearing tide, that rusty boot. Snot green, blue silver, rust, coloured signs. Limits of the diaphragm. But he adds, in bodies. Then he was aware of them bodies, before of them coloured. How? By knocking his science against them, sure. Go easy. Bald he was and a millionaire. Maestro di colère, ce namo. Limit of the diaphanin. Why in? Diaphan, a diaphane. If you can put your five fingers through it, it is a gate, if not a door. Shut your eyes and see. Stephen closed his eyes to hear his boots crush crackling rack and shells. You are walking through it howsomever. I am astride at a time. A very short space of time, true very short times of space. Five, six, the Nahainander. Exactly. And that is the ineluctable modality of the audible. Open your eyes. No, Jesus. If I fell over a cliff that beetles over its base, fell through the Nibenander ineluctably, I'm getting on nicely in the dark. My ash sword hangs at my side. Tap with it, they do. My two feet in his boots are at the ends of his legs. Nave and thine ender. Sounds solid, made by the mallet of Los Demiurgus. Am I walking into eternity along Sandy Man Strand? Crush, crack, crick, crick, wild sea money. Domini DC, Ken's the man. There you go, a little taster. So if you haven't read it, do read it. And then you can come next year when we'll be back in Damaras for Bloomsday and you can get up on stage and read a bit of it. Uh, but I won't hold you to any promises. So. I'll hand you back to Mose. Thanks very much for the time. And I'm going to enjoy listening in uh, to the rest of you. Thank you. Uh, you. Catherine is going to facilitate the open mic. Well, so, so far, I only have one name. So it'll be easy to facilitate <laughs> so far. Um, so I call on D. D, do you want to read? That's why I'm here. <laughs> All right, let me put on my camera. Would you now, like you are, now you are face to face with the most unphotogenic person you will ever see on camera. Ah, <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> Denzel Washington, I am not, trust me. All right, I only know maybe two of you here, Catherine and Miss Margaret O'Regan. So I'm, as for the rest of you, I'm going to introduce myself to you properly. I'm D. Allen from Oakland, California, USA, and I'm going to do two poems on this Bloom Day 2021. But before I go into them, a little Zoom etiquette. If you like what you hear coming from me today, you can respond by leaving your comments in Zoom chat, send me a private message through Zoom chat, or click on the reactions button for hands clapping.
thumbs up. Or if you totally dig the piece I've just done, there's always the big red heart for love. Now, the two pieces I'm about to do come from my fifth book, Elo Yonichi, Poems, 2013 to 2018, released Earth Day 2020. And to assist me in that endeavor, I'm gonna use the share screen feature. And you just got two more people for the open mic. The first poem happens to be an ode to this little guy you're seeing on the screen now. And this comes from section two of the book entitled Beauty of Nature. From pages 34 and 35, this is called Totem. From a long black cord surrounding my neck, I carry my strength. Smooth carved apple coral, blood red stone totem. Crawling bear facing the east, sky blue lifeline points to the western edge of creation. Area he defends throughout the year, then he hibernates in dreams during winter. What the bear seeks is medicine, what the bear finds is medicine, what the bear eats is medicine, what the bear exudes is medicine, meant for our withstanding the chaos. Cave dwelling woodland animal, spirit sacred to the Zuni, the Anasazi. Yona Navwadi, bear medicine to the Chalagi, also known as the Cherokee Indians. The beast that walks firmly on faux legs or two, like a man, best represents internal strength I could use, worn as an outer totem around my neck. And that first poem was called Totem, which is an ode to this little guy here. And this happens to be the, the stone carved blood red bear totem that I mentioned in the poem. And this was given to me as a gift from a fellow writer from San Francisco named Richard Allen Sanderell, known locally as the cursive writer. He went out to a Native American powwow in Arizona about four or five years ago. And when he came back home to San Francisco, he came back with several of these, gave me this one. This little symbol on a black cord that I'm dangling now that represents the internal strength that lies in every one of you and me, in women, men, and, and other. The internal strength that could be derived from our mighty woodland friend, the bear. And a little side note for a moment, Richard Allen Sanderell, the cursive writer, died about a month ago on the morning of May 4th. He died in his sleep. He was only 75 years old and he left behind a great body of work. He was well loved to the Native American community and fellow war veterans. He will be missed by the San Francisco Bay Area. Rest in peace, brother. And the last poem also comes from section three of the book entitled Travels Through Nature. And these are poems based on green areas that I've traveled to in the recent past. Even Brendan McCormick might appreciate these since he's an environmental writer himself. And I'm gonna use the share screen feature one more time. Anyone living in the continental United States knows where this is, but since y'all live in Ireland, this is called the Grand Canyon of Arizona, one of America's best green areas. From page 53 in Eloy or Nietzsche, this is called the Grand Canyon. I knew I'd become part of something grand the moment I disembarked the tour bus, ran across the parking lot, trying out race a rain shower. It ended as soon as it began. I watched my final destination stretched out before me. Intermittent rainfall, wind, the failure of slopes, the mighty Colorado River, over 500 aeons molded deep furrows, jagged buttes, time sharpened mesas widened an 18 mile rift across this island earth 
Mother Nature is quite the accomplished sculptress. From the eastern rim, sand caked limestone cliff where I stood, I couldn't see the Colorado River force itself past towering walls, exposed layers of minerals. A steam powered train from Williams, Arizona brought me to the south rim. Then the full tour bus transported me to where the air had a vanilla scent around ponderosa pines and trotting elks, the chasm of my fifth grade dreams. I knew I'd become part of something grand the moment I confronted that canyon. That last poem was called The Grand Canyon, which was basically me fulfilling a boyhood dream I've had since the age of 11 of visiting the Grand Canyon. And in the summer of 2016, when I turned, right after I turned 48, I was finally there. And both poems come from my fifth book, Elo Yonichi, now available from Conviction to Change Publishing. From this mic to your ears, I'm D. Allen. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the rest of Bloom Day. Rest in peace, Richard Sandorell. Thank you so much, D. Fabulous. Next up is Colin Scully. Thanks, thanks, Catherine. Um, that, that was really uh, good, D. Um, I was going to read something from, given that it's Bloom's Day, if it's okay, I'll just read another short excerpt from, excerpt from uh, Ulysses, if that's okay. Um, so I just picked something out here from Hades. Um, and this is uh, in the, it's, it's, it's in the graveyard, um, Glasnevin graveyard, I think, is it? And then um, Bloom is there for the funeral of, of um, Dignan. And um, so here goes. The caretaker put the papers in his pocket. The barrow had ceased to trundle. The mourners split and moved to each side of the hole, stepping with care round the graves. The grave diggers bored a coffin and set its nose on the brink, looping the bands round it. Burying him, we come to bury Caesar. His sides of March or June. He doesn't know who is here, nor care. Now who is that lanky looking glute over there in the Macintosh? Now who is he, I'd like to know. Now I'd give a trifle to know who he is. Always someone turns up you never dream of. A fellow could live on the lonesome all his life. Yes, he could. Still, he'd have to get someone to sod him after he died, though he could dig his own grave. We all do. Only man buries. No ants, too. First thing strikes anybody, bury the dead. Say Robinson Crusoe was true to life. Well, then Friday buried him. Every Friday buries a Thursday, if you come to look at it. Oh, poor Robinson Crusoe. How could you pubs possibly do so? Poor Dignam. His last lie on the earth in his box. When you think of them all, it does seem a waste of wood. All gnawed through. They could invent a handsome buyer with a kind of panel sliding let down that way. Ah, uh, but they might object to the being buried out of another fellow's. They're so particular. Lay me in my own native earth. Bit of clay from the holy land. Only a mother and dead-born child ever buried into one coffin. I see what it means, I see, to protect them as long as possible, even in the earth. The Irishman's house is his coffin. Embalming and catacombs, mummies, the same idea. Mr. Bloom stood far back, his hat in his hand, counting the bared heads. Twelve. I'm thirteen. No. The chap in the Macintosh is thirteen. Death's number. Where the juice did he pop out of? He wasn't in the chapel. That I'll swear. Silly superstition that about thirteen. Nice soft tweed Ned Lambert has in his suit. Tinge of purple. I had one like that when we lived in Lombard Street, West. 
Especially fellow who was once used to change three time three suits in the day. Must get that grey suit of mine turned turned by Messi Messius. Hello, it's died. His wife, I forgot, he's not married. Or his landlady ought to have picked out those trades for him. The coffin died out dived out of sight. Eased down by men straddled on the grave trestles. They struggled up and out, and all uncovered twenty. Pause. If we were all suddenly somebody else. Thanks. I love your reading of Joyce, Colm. I could I could listen to more of that. Audiobook next for you, Colm, I think. And uh, next up, we have Christina. Hi, um, just turn my video. Can you see me? Hello, um, I'm Christina. I'm from West Cork, but I'm living in Cork City at the moment. Um, I have two poems as well. Um, the first one is called A Day in Kerry. Um, so I'll just read it. I think it's self-explanatory enough. Um, A Day in Kerry. The island's cold breath brushed through the valleys and battled fiercely against a patient, long-determined son. We piled into your car and took off, took, took off for Dingle, a string top and a hoodie with a fine tug value just in case. The morning radio blasted tunes you'd never heard. I laughed as you gasped your first taste of Ireland, her curls of green tumbling endlessly before you. Royal sheep, sheep nipped at the fresh dewed grass, the swift swish swish of the sea in the distance and the cliffs falling in sharp lines, stacked up against the hip of the horizon that slapped you square with her beauty. Deep pockets of Irish sand sat beneath us and as we inhaled every rare ray that lifted us out of thought and into now and I felt the trembling envy of the town's sad aquarium. We both grateful for the other on our day out, the pair of us like premature widowers, glad of the company, gobbling happy 99s for a resentful 280. Our skin rushed red as a robin as we talked, as we walked through up and down the town and upon a wedding with them talking wonderfully of the fine day they've had as the child of Prag sat smirking knowingly out the front of the home place in Killarney. With one winked eye, you took in the breath of sea and pier, this, the call of seagulls mar marking Western shore and the wild foam recounting histories of the Atlantic. Sing to us, wild ocean. What but days like this is worth the many storms you deliver daily, bashing your hurt against stubborn Irish rock. You wouldn't get it as fine in Spain and the new Aussies crying out to be home with us here again. A happy 99 in hand and a bulmer is waiting in the pub. The time crept up on us then like a sad puppy, ready to go home. We packed our pinking limbs into your car as the island's shepherd's sky appeared joyfully before us and headed back to Cork. The long determined sun slowly surrendering to the stars. This one is called I Didn't Mean a Da, and it was written after it was written after the death of Lyra McKee in Derry. Um, I think it was 2018. Uh, could have been 2019. Um, I think it was 2018. But anyway, um, so this is called I Didn't Mean a Da. You handed a bomb to your son when he was born. You wrapped it up real nice and put a timer on it. You soaked it in your tragedy and hung it from his neck. You told him it was a gift, even better, a cause. And you watched him, trained him with conviction in your heart saying it's not over yet, son. It's not over yet. Until one day you came to know 
the price of your bitterness. When your son came home dressed in black from the cold dairy streets, with his hands shaking, his jaw breaking, and him screaming at you. I didn't mean it, da. 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 How odd it must have been to host your boy's funeral in the middle of the kitchen and him not dead yet. The ring of his anguish trapped in the open press that will call at you like a sad bell as you reach for the tea, salt or sugar, like a timered lament to the scene that is stuck there. The mirror of his mother in the fogged pane as she stumbles upon ye, her hair still drying, her eyes gasped in panic, and he, with his hands shaking, his jaw breaking, and him screaming at you. I didn't mean it, da. 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 Thanks so much, Christina. I love your line, a happy 99 and a Bulmers. I'll join you for those someday. <laughs> Next up, we have Michael Ray. Thank, uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, great to hear Brendan's dulcet tones. It's been a long time, Brendan. Uh, so this poem's called um, 1100237. It's not the road from the farm that sudden shudder when tar gives way to the rattle of bars, or whether you had the chance to lean out and taste the wind smoothing the green downs down to the dunes, to hear the sea breaking apart and shushing back together below the boat, winched up the slip and slumped like an animal beneath the sky's morning clay. All the obscene trays in the window filled with chops and a clean pair of trotters tied with a white string bow. Or your intelligent head, a number tattooed in abattoir violet on what remains of your neck. What troubles me are the tiny vessels full of blood running through the whites of your eyes. Tributaries trying to flee some great trauma. And that's just the only one I'm going to subject you to this evening. Thank you. Well, you already know, Michael, I'm a huge fan of your work. So thank you for that. Um, next up, we have Margaret O'Regan. Thanks, Catherine. Um, this is a very short one. Um, it's called Love Undiluted. Um, and for it, I had to study the effects on the brain and everything. So um, Doc Jenning a fellow poet tells me it's um, exactly correct because he's a retired doctor. Anyway, it's also an acrostic poem. So love undiluted is down on the left-hand side. Love, when it embeds, when it embodies, ought to be known, ought to notice, velvet-like softness, enveloping the mind and heart. Under the skin, under the rim, naked desire seething within, dreamily sending high voltage signals in sparks and synapses, connecting, lustily fusing, cylinders firing, undulating free floating filaments, terminal throbbing, primed and longing, excitedly rushing towards neurotransmission, dripping, gushing in rapid release. That's it. Wouldn't doubt you, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody I've missed? Okay, I'm going to add one of my own. So, um, in it, it's my Joycean tree, which you could say. 
It's called Collars. It's very short. Collars. I pour into your licorice mouth. Love the taste. Our tongues turn black in confession. Naked fields, white folds of sleep. You hum in my ear. We crawl towards dawn. Get dressed again. Love that one. Brendan, do you know about this book, Aloysius the Great by John Maxwell O'Brien? No, no, it's I don't based, actually. It's based on Ulysses. It's a complete romp. It is such a funny read. <laughs> it, it is unreal. What's the name of the author? John Maxwell O'Brien. He's also a poet. He's a retired professor. He's um, a Ulysses scholar. And he called it Aloysius the Great because he brings in Aloysius, well, Alexander the Great. It's kind of like a satire <laughs> sort of. So funny. It is just so funny. There's a Professor Moriarty in it. And <laughs> his shenanigans are very entertaining. <laughs> I'll have to treat myself to that at some stage. Oh, <laughs> really, really, he'll love that. If Joycey and people thought it, like he loves that. Are we done? <laughs> anybody else want to read? What? I don't think there's anybody else wants to read anything. Okay. Because then I'm going to close the session and announce. Thanks for it. Thanks for the knife. That was nice. Yeah, it was. Thanks everyone for. Thanks reading. very much. Yeah, um, no, thanks, Mose. Good to hear you, Michael, again after such a long time. I'll have to come back and listen to you more often. You haven't <laughs> lost your skills or your neck. <laughs> um, I, I'm. I well, we got to thank everyone, including the Cork Arts Office and the Barras. <laughs> And everyone who read here, and Andrea Carter, who's a great talker and reader and writer. And I uh, really enjoyed all your poetry and next and readings. And next uh, session is on July 14th. Um, and our special guest that night will be Massimo Elijah. He's a poet and uh, a really good one. And we don't know what he's going to do, but it's going to be great. So um, I look forward to seeing you all and I wish you a lovely summery June, July blooms. May it bloom. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.